Hello, this is Ben Brownlee from Curious Turtle, and we're going to be taking a look at the Stabilize module in Mocha Pro. Now, you join me about seven minutes into this project. What I've done is I have created a number of different layers here and just tracked them. Um, I haven't done anything else particularly clever with them at all. No adjust tracks or anything like that. All the data is just uh, just as it arrives straight out of Mocha Pro. Now, at first, this looks like it might be an exercise for the remove module to be able to remove this guy's head. And indeed, that was the, the aim of this actual shot. Something else we had to do in the shot was actually to add a little bit of stabilization to it. Because as you can see, it's a, uh, it's a handheld camera shaking about too much. It worked quite nicely for the, uh, for the style of the piece. It was a little bit too much judder, even for the, uh, even for the style. So I'm going to come over and go to, uh, go to our stabilize module here. And you'll see that immediately, as soon as I go into stabilize, the image starts to change up. And if I just hit play on that, you can see it's actually, without me doing anything else, it started to stabilize the, the image up based on whichever layer I've got selected down here. So if we want to stabilize it with the building track instead as the focus, we can do that there. Or as the body track, or as the head track, or as the legs track. So you can see just how responsive this actually is. Now I'm going to um, stabilize this around my sky here, and we can get pretty much real time feedback for um, for the changes that we're going to make. So this is really really useful when it comes to determining uh, what we actually need it to do. So we take a look down here in the stabilized module. What we have here is the uh, a list of the things that are being stabilized. So at the moment it's only stabilizing the x and y translation. So just stabilizing out the position for us. But we can also add the other elements to the mix. So we can add rotation all the way up to zoom, shear, and perspective. And if we take a look at, I just pause it around about here, you can really start to see what, um, what shear and perspective are actually doing. And that gives a good result, but um, for the sake of this shot, I'm just gonna turn off everything apart from the translation and the rotation there. Now, the amount of smoothing we've got going on, you'll notice that this isn't a um, completely steady shot, as if it was uh, completely, completely stabilized. Well, if we want that, if we want that sort of locked off sort of style, we can turn on maximum smoothing down here, and this will try and lock us back as far as possible into, uh, into a completely steady shot. Now you might start to see some, some sort of artifacting going on, and that's actually perfectly natural um, because remember we're stabilizing up what was a, uh, a moving camera. So those, those small changes, especially with a wide angle lens, creates different sorts of parallax and different sorts of uh, distortion going on here. So stabilizing that up too much can give some weird sort of uh, fairly unnatural looking results here. So if we take a look at the car here, actually it's not too bad at all, but you, it is noticeable. So instead of stabilizing this shot completely, what I want to do is I want to keep the, um, the natural motion of the camera. I just want to make it a bit smoother. So let's come back, set our maximum smoothing back off. I'm going to turn my Uber key back on here. Now what the Uber key does is it makes sure that any changes that we make onto any of the uh, any of the parameters affect all of the keyframes in this range equally. So the basic upshot of this is, is that I'm not going to be laying down some new keyframes every time I make a, a little change down here. And in this situation, that's, that's really, really useful. So instead of having the maximum smoothing turned on, I can actually define how many um, frames are going to be smoothed. So at the moment, our frames, a number of frames is down to 10. If I turn this down all the way down, maybe just to one, this is going to give me really no smoothing whatsoever. If I turn this up just a little bit, this will only start to smooth out the largest of the movements. So this is actually really useful when we have just a, a slight pop or a slight hop in the image that we can just uh, we can just get rid of it by taking that number of keyframes down or number of frames down quite low. 
and in the opposite way we can turn the number of frames up insanely high and this will just completely smooth out the motion across the entire range of the clip here so even though we've got a actually quite a large camera move that happens by turning the number of frames up quite a lot it does smooth out a lot of that uh, a lot of that movement there now of course that comes at the expense of, of taking away some of the um of some of that steadiness but that's the uh, that's the balance you have to strike with your particular your particular shot now i'm going to take this down fairly low just to give us quite a lot of work maybe not that low so i'll take us down to about 14 then let's see how we go now a great thing about this is that you know where we do have a significant camera move which we do have here we get quite a lot of black borders around the edge you know that's that's actually unavoidable as part of the stabilizing what you're doing is repositioning you know adjusting the rotation so you will get black borders around the edge here now if you want to avoid that and still keep the um the smoothing going on we can use this frame list here to actually set i'm going to just add one here so we can use the frame list here to set where we want to have the original camera position come back in so instead of ending with our shot completely filled with black over there what i can do is at certain points in the video one about here is add another frame here and at frame 44, I'm going to be back at my original um, at my original shot. So what Mocha Pro is doing here is it's smoothing the image up and then mixing that back in such a way that at frame 44, I'm going to end up at my original frame. There we go. In quite a smooth and natural way. We can do the same here where we come in just a little bit too far. Add frame 73 to my frame list here. And that minimizes a lot of those black edges coming in around the, uh, around the frame. Cool, so what if I wanted this a bit smoother? Well, let's, um, actually not a bit smoother, a bit steadier. Let's take my number of frames down to seven here. So this has steadied things up a little bit, but at the expense of being a bit more sort of jittery around the edges and giving me a lot more uh, black edges around here. Now, in the same way that we can export out the regular tracking data to a number of different applications, we can also export out this new stabilized tracking data to the same application. So After Effects, Autodesk, Nuke, um, Final Cut, Motion, you know, the whole, the whole list here, um, Avid, of course. And this will export out the um, the correct set of keyframes we need to stabilize our data in our favorite compositor. So we can do the um, the scaling and, and the rest of the stuff there. Now we can also do um, scaling right within Mocha Pro as well. If we turn on uh, center and zoom here, this will then scale center and zoom our um, our image up to get rid of that black border. Now it really doesn't matter which compositing program you're working in. Uh, whether you're actually doing the um, the rendering here within Mocha Pro or in your compositing app, if you do any sort of uh, of scaling up here to get rid of the black borders, you are going to be compromising the quality of the image. The upshot is you're probably going to end up with a softer image than you started with. So this is why let's turn center and zoom off here. So Mocha Pro as artists, we now have another option available to us, and that's the auto fill here. So if I come to auto fill. And turn this on. What autofill is going to do is it's going to build up the image from other frames. And let's just come over here to my little black border here. And by building up the image in that way, we don't have that same um, need to do any upscaling because what we're going to be doing is taking pixels from a different point of time where the scale is still 100%. So we're actually filling in this data with pixels at 100% rather than having to scale things up. Cool. Well, let's just see how that's going to work. Well, I'm going to just Without doing any other um, changes, I'm just going to hit my render button over here. And once that's rendered, let's take a little look at that. That's now rendered up. That's now filled in that pixel. That's now filled in that area. 
to take a look at the original, has now filled in that area with fresh pixels here. And that's done that across the range where I've got my, um, my shape data. So down here where we don't have any shapes or any planes defined, then we've still got the, um, the black area here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna clear the frame list of one here so we can get a slightly more visible result. Um, so I'm gonna do the, exactly the same thing with this here. So sometimes what will happen is that you won't have any data going within that particular search range. So we can crank the search range up um, to, let's crank that up to all the way to, up to 40. And what this will do then is it will search, instead of just searching 10 frames back and forth for the missing data, it will then search the extra frames going, going back and forth for you, to, just to see whether it can fill in from that data. And in this case, it's been able to find it when it's searching a higher number of frames. Now, what you'll also notice is if I turn off my overlays here, is that it is only going up to the distance of our shape. So we do need to have stuff tracked in there. But the great thing is we can track in multiple objects. Let's turn my ground plane on here as well. So let's come into my ground plane here and just extend that out a little bit. Make sure I've just got the render cog turned on to the ground track as well as the sky track, and let's just re-render that. So now if we have a look down here, that will then pull in the rest of that data for us as well there. So we can build up multiple planes in a, uh, an image here if we need to. Cool, and sometimes we'll ju we just won't have that data. So what we can do there is we can just fill from background, hit render out again, and where it can't find the... Um, the regular data for it uh, in a in a particular plane here. What it's going to do is it's going to fill in those extra gaps just with some of the previous frames. So in this case, if the cam because the camera has moved a bit here, this isn't um, this isn't matching up absolutely perfectly as it is doing where we've got the uh, where we've got the sky coming in there and the uh, the ground down here. But a lot of cases where there's not a lot of camera movement, just having something of a uh, of a similar value here is enough not to draw the eye to, a, uh, to the black mark there. Because of course, if you're doing your job right, the main focus of the action isn't gonna be on these small little uh, details over here. It's gonna be on the main action going on within this part of the frame here. So a lot of, a lot of the time actually, it's, it's enough to have something filling in the gap here, which while not 100% perfect, is enough not to draw the eye away from the main action. I'm gonna leave that there. I hope that's given you a brief idea of, uh, of what we can do with the, the stabilized module. And of course, there's a lot of other functionality we didn't go through in this short tutorial, but um, hopefully that's gonna be enough to get you started. My name's Ben Brownlee from Curious Turtle. Thanks for joining me again.